Dear President, uh, dear Mrs. Lanfalusi and family, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, today the National Bank of Belgium is proud and happy too. Proud and happy that today it can pay tribute to one of Belgium's most important Europeans, Alexandre Lanfalusi by organizing the first of a series of lectures in his name as a follow-up to its scientific conferences. Born in Hungary, but not even 20 years old when he fled to Belgium, Lanfalusi exemplified the virtues that make men great. Intellectual depth, which he refined during his brilliant academic studies in Louvain and Oxford, and which helped him to continue questioning accepted theories with a dose of iconoclasm. Forward-looking vision that put him in a position to spot very early on the risks for the entire financial system that can arise from excessive debt or developments in the international economy, for instance. And so almost 40 years ago, he had already directed his attention to, and I'm quoting, problems that bear upon the market as a whole, as distinct from an individual bank and which may not be obvious at the microprudential level, adopting a sort of macroprudential reflex avant la lettre. And last but not least, the deep conviction and courage that he demonstrated in the highly prominent positions that he held as general manager of the Bank for International Settlements, as a member of the Delors Committee that prepared EMU, as president of the European Monetary Institute. It is fortunate that Alexandre Lanfalusi dedicated this unique combination of personal qualities to the central banking community, from which so much has been expected in recent years. Central banks which, in Lanfalusi's own words, whether they like it or not, are in the front line when it comes to keeping crisis manifestations under control. And it is Equally fortunate that this great man, scarred by the bitter experience with the fallout from the Second World War and the Europe divided by the Iron Curtain, devoted much of his life to a European integration project that was to become so important for our prosperity and our future. And while arguing consistently in favor of a monetary and financial union that would be underpinned by fiscal and economic coordination. Intellectual depth, forward-looking vision, encouraged, based on conviction, at the service of the central banking community and incredible commitment to the European project, these are qualities that we also recognize one by one in the person to hold the first of these Lanfalusi key lectures, Mario Draghi, and that he has very generously dedicated to the diverse range of key functions that he has held as professor of economics at various universities, as an executive director of the World Bank, as director general of the Italian Treasury, as Chairman of the European Union's Economic and Financial Committee, as Governor of the Banca d'Italia, as Chairman of the Financial Stability Board, and of course, for some time now, as President of the European Central Bank, as well as of the European Systemic Risk Board and the Bank for International Settlements Group of Governors and head, Heads of Supervision. Dear President, um, you have given and you continue to give the ECB outstanding leadership, often 
navigating in uncharted waters, an expression that Alexandre Lanfalusi liked to use. Through the response to the deep financial and sovereign debt crisis, through mapping out a monetary policy that has been consistently focused on fulfilling the mandate and thus contributing to the clear revival of the economy and employment and a strengthened confidence in getting back to our inflation target. Through the efficient development of the first pillar of the banking union, the single supervisory mechanism. And especially the way in which you have used your qualities and conviction and continue to use them for the integrity of the euro, our sing single currency, the currency that is shared by 340 million people from 19 European countries earns nothing but respect and admiration. As I myself, uh, I'm not so far from the end of my mandate as governor of the National Bank, may already take the liberty of saying to you here today, before this large audience, that I was happy and proud to have served under your presidency. And the National Bank of Belgium is happy and proud that you are the first person to give the Lanfalusi lecture. I gladly leave you on the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind, affectionate words. Dear Mrs. Lanfalusi and family, I understand it's only a minor share of the big family today, but it's so nice to see and look at you. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, advanced economies are now emerging from the aftermath of the great financial crisis. Despite the largest shock in the post-war period, central banks have succeeded in maintaining price stability and fulfilling their mandates. A key factor behind this has been central bank independence. But despite its benefits, its desirability and relevance are nowadays increasingly challenged. The rationale for delegating powers to independent central banks evolved mainly from the experience of the 1970s. At this time, policymakers believed that there was a stable trade-off between unemployment and inflation, whereby monetary policy could achieve permanently higher employment at the cost of slightly higher inflation. The trade-off rested on the notion that an increase in the money supply could boost aggregate demand and stimulate employment, while keeping inflation expectations well anchored. This policy was revealed to be time inconsistent. Over time, commitments to control inflation at a later date lost credibility. The public came to anticipate the behavior of monetary policy and quickly embedded expectations of higher inflation in their price setting and wage bargaining. The trade-off between unemployment and inflation disappeared. In the US, for example, year ahead inflation expectations rose continuously from around 4% in 1970 to 12% in 1979. Inflation stood between 3 and 12% in the United States at that time, for the whole decade. But there was no fall in unemployment, which oscillated between 4% and 9%. In fact, inflation and unemployment had a tendency to rise together. Therefore, to overcome time inconsistency, central banks had to regain credibility as institutions capable of delivering price stability. They thus committed to a non-inflationary path while resisting any political pressure to pursue objectives other than price stability. As um, two economists, Alezina and Summers, showed Central banks that acted in this way, such as the Bundesbank, for example, 
Actually, it's not for example, it was only the Bundesbank, if I correctly remember. Um, the Bundesbank, such as the Bundesbank, had managed to achieve lower inflation without suffering output or employment penalty. Annual inflation in Germany from 1970 to 1990 averaged just 3.8% where in France it averaged 7.9% and in Italy 11.8%. At the same time, unemployment in Germany over the same period averaged just 3.6%, where in France was 56 in Italy 64 Societies gradually converged on a framework whereby monetary policy was removed from the pressures of the short-term political agendas and delegated to independent central banks. A clear social consensus had emerged that price stability was a common good under all circumstances, but its achievement depended on the right institutional framework. This rested on three elements. Central banks needed a clear mandate to achieve price stability, they needed independence over the instruments they could use to achieve their mandate, and monetary policy had to be embedded in a strong accountability framework to explain how the central bank's decisions contributed to this goal. This framework provided a guarantee for the public that independent central banks would not exercise power arbitrarily. Their discretion was limited to how they formulated monetary policy. They had no discretion over whether to pursue their goals and what goal they had to achieve. It is on this basis that the mandate of the European Central Bank was established. For much of the 90s and early 2000s, the monetary policy framework was unquestioned. There was a broad consensus that the shift towards central bank independence had been successful in bringing inflation under control. Cross-country studies found a clear negative relationship between independence and inflation in OECD economies. Moreover, central bank independence was seen as a key factor in the lower volatility of output and inflation observed over this period the phenomenon identified as the great moderation. The variability of real output growth was found to have declined by half since the mid-80s, while the variability of inflation had declined by two-thirds. Importantly, central banks had been able to maintain low and stable inflation using a single instrument, policy interest rates, which caused few concerns. Interest rate policy was perceived to be a normal tool of monetary policy and create few distributional effects. Then the great financial crisis hit, and this led to a steep drop in both output and inflation across all economies. This presented central banks with two new challenges. The first challenge was to their objectives. For the first time in living memory, there was a threat of a deflationary spiral taking hold. This would have led not only to central banks failing their mandates, but to the whole economy sinking into a prolonged depression, just as happened in the 1930s. The second challenge was to central banks' instruments. Faced with these deflationary threats, central banks responded decisively with conventional policy, but they which is to lower interest rates, but they eventually ran into the lower bound on interest rates. And this required them to adopt new unconventional measures, such as large-scale asset purchases to stabilize inflation. The new environment of low inflation and unconventional policies was led to questions about the key tenets of the pre-crisis monetary policy consensus. Some now query whether the conditions that justified central bank independence are still in place, and whether the grounds for delegating monetary policy to independent authorities remain valid. The first claim 
is that in a lower inflation environment, the time inconsistency problem that emerged in the 1970s has become less relevant. As such, independent central banks are no longer a necessity to ensure credibility and keep inflation expectations anchored. Such reasoning rests on two assumptions. First, that inflationary pressures have by and large disappeared in advanced economies. And second, that the social consensus behind price stability is now so well established that elected authorities would not compromise it in the pursuit of other objectives. Both of these assumptions can be questioned. First, the absence of inflationary pressures in recent years is well explained by two factors, and neither would justify a change to the monetary policy framework. One is the stability of the monetary regime, which has meant that economic shocks no longer have lasting effects on inflation, both during slumps and during booms. This is a direct result of the success of central banks over the past 20 years in anchoring expectations and reducing inflation volatility. So the response to a stable inflation environment should not be to dismantle the framework that has delivered it. The other factor is the depth of the crisis that struck advanced economies, which created unusually high unemployment and made inflation less responsive as the labor market recovered. But here, too, there would be little to be gained by making central banks less independent. Long-term institutional arrangements built around a strong social consensus should not be changed due to the cyclically driven developments of inflation. But are there, going, are there ongoing structural changes in the economy, as some argue, that will permanently contain inflationary pressures in the future? The notion that inflation is a non-monetary phenomenon is not new. In, the 19, in 1971, the Federal Reserve policymakers argued that inflation was, I quote now, a structural problem not amenable to macroeconomic measures. And similar statements can be found in the records of other central banks throughout the 70s. The Fed's view only changed when Paul Volcker arrived as chairman in 1979 and affirmed the responsibility of monetary policy. Today, we are witnessing major demographic and technological changes, but these do not necessarily imply that structural factors are the main drivers of inflation. Indeed, the impact of demographic change on inflation is unclear. It might put downward pressure on prices if aggregate demand falls more than aggregate supply, but it might equally create upward pressures. According to the life cycle hypothesis, with an aging population, the elderly will eventually spend their savings and consume more. The impact of technological changes such as e-commerce is also inconclusive. E-commerce could, in principle, erode the monopolistic power of suppliers, which would reduce the markups and flatten the Phillips curve. That is, lower level of unemployment would not necessarily lead to faster wage increases. But it may also result in suppliers changing prices more frequently, which would result in a steeper Phillips curve. So, in any event, the effects of structural changes cannot create steady state disinflation. They can only lead to potentially long transition to a new steady state. Whether inflation is higher or lower over time will depend on the reaction of monetary policy along the way. And what recent experience suggests is that independent central banks remain the best institutions to anchor inflation expectations through such long transitions. This brings me to the second assumption about the incentives of elected authorities, what we call the politicians. The belief that they will no longer compromise price stability in the pursuit of other short-term objectives is not borne out by what we have seen in recent years and even what we see right now. In fact, it has become evident that time inconsistency is a recurring risk that arises in both high and low inflation environments. When inflation is rising, 
short-term political considerations still create a certain set of incentives to pressure central banks into prioritizing economic growth and avoiding monetary tightening. And when inflation is falling, we have seen over the past few years, we've seen even the ECB, that there are incentives to prioritize considerations like moral hazard and financial sector concerns and to oppose monetary easing. Such as, just think about the, all the protests against low interest, too low interest rates. Such incentives were visible in the euro area during the crisis. Despite an observable slide in inflation, there were those who opposed responding with unconventional measures because they feared that they feared the possible effects on government's willingness to enact reforms or on banks' incentives to clean up their balance sheets. These risks were prioritized over the certainty that price stability would be sacrificed without action, without action. And today, in other parts of the world, in other jurisdictions, we see concerns being publicly expressed about whether the central bank should pursue a normalization path in the face of rising inflation. These facts, these deeds, have so far had limited consequences, only because central banks are independent and credible. But if central banks were less independent and the public perceived that monetary policy could be pressured in either direction, it would eventually de-anchor inflation expectations and jeopardize price stability just as it happened in the 70s. The crisis has also, also raised questions about the relationship between monetary and fiscal policies. First, it is said that once central banks use unconventional measures that entail buying large volumes of government bonds, they cross the boundary and they get into fiscal policy. Thereby, they exceed their mandates and the scope of their independence. Such reasoning, however, ignores key aspects of our institutional framework. The specific design of central banks' mandates, which gives them independence over their tools, but not independence over their goals, was put in place because no one could foresee all the challenges that monetary policy might face in the future. So allowing central banks leeway over their instruments was the best way to ensure that, come what may, the social consensus in favor of price stability could be maintained. The actions of central banks during the crisis not only followed this principle to the letter, they demonstrated precisely why it was necessary in the first place. With conventional policy no longer sufficient to secure price stability, central banks would have failed their mandates without instrument independence. But by expanding their set of tools, they extended their policy space so that they could deliver their objective. Though the measures we used were unprecedented, the shift was only in form, not in function. Their function was exactly the same as conventional policy, to increase money and credit aggregates, lift demand, and stabilize medium-term inflation around our objective. Indeed, Milton Friedman argued, of all people, argued that asset purchases are not only an appropriate tool of monetary policy, but under certain circumstances, they are essential to boost money supply and maintain price stability. He therefore supported their use during deflationary episodes, such as the Great Depression or Japan in the 90s. The fact that deploying asset purchases was fully in line with our mandate was confirmed by the European Court of Justice in its judgment on our OMT, Outright Monetary Transactions Program. It ruled that purchases of government bonds are legal under ECB statute and a legitimate tool of monetary policy. 
Another challenge to central bank independence is related to the effectiveness of monetary policy at the lower bound on interest rates. So when interest rates get to zero or any lower bound. When they fall towards zero, it's argued monetary policy becomes ineffective since it enters a liquidity trap where it can no longer stimulate demand. In these conditions, fiscal policy is needed to stabilize inflation. For as long as interest rates remain constrained by the lower bound, the argument goes, monetary policy should therefore support fiscal policy to achieve price stability. But central bank independence, it is said, impedes such coordination. Well, to begin with, the notion that monetary policy is ineffective when lower bound is reached has been disproved by experience of the crisis. There is now a wealth of evidence showing that the unconventional policies adopted by central banks have eased financing conditions, boosted output, and stabilized inflation. In the ECB's case, there was a particular question about whether our asset purchases would be effective in a bank-based economy. But we estimated the growth rate of bank lending to euro era firms would be more than a third lower today without our package of credit easing measures. And the rates the banks charge for firms to borrow money would have been around 50% higher today. This isn't to say that monetary policy could not benefit from greater alignment with fiscal policy when faced with a deep slump. In the Euro era, for example, it was clear that the lack of supportive aggregate fiscal stance was a headwind for monetary policy during the whole crisis. But for such policy alignment to be successful, it has to be on the basis of every authority fulfilling its own mandate in full independence. The existence of multiple actors in setting macroeconomic policy requires clear mandates to avoid what, again, Milton Friedman described as the dispersal of responsibility, which promotes, shrink, which, which promotes shrink, shirking of responsibility in times of uncertainty and difficulty. Moreover, if central banks were to enter into a form of coordination with fiscal authorities that reduce their independence, it would ultimately be self-defeating. While the mandate of the ECB is price stability, fiscal authorities have multiple mandates. So if the central bank were to submit to political control, coordination with the fiscal authority would be unlikely to be limited to the lower bound. Fiscal authorities would have an incentive to use monetary policy to achieve other objectives as well. And this would end up in monetary policy becoming fiscally dominated, which history shows is inconsistent with price stability in the long run. But there is one other claim against uh, independence, against central bank independence, and that relates to the distributional effects of unconventional policies. In particular, it's argued that the distributional effects are much larger than the ones that we have for the conventional policies. But the delegation of monetary policy to an independent body rests on the premise that such effects are not first order. Unconventional policies are perceived to have larger distributional effects because they involve active intervention in financial markets and conventional policies are perceived to have lower distributional effects because they entail passively providing liquidity to banks. That's the difference. But it's an incorrect perception for two reasons. First, conventional policies also produce different effects on creditors and debtors. So when we move interest rates, creditors and debtors do benefit or not out of that in different ways. And empirical evidence suggests that the effects on distribution of both conventional and unconventional policies are in any case limited. In the long run, monetary policy is not an important factor for the distribution of resources within societies. 
Distribution is affected more by low frequency developments, such as structural and institutional factors, or by fiscal policies, such as tax regimes. In the short run, monetary policy can influence distribution by, via two channels, a direct effect related to asset prices and financial income, and an indirect effect related to the macroeconomic impact that exp expansionary policies have on unemployment and job creation, and real wages, of course. But the net effect on distribution appears to be balanced. So the various effects appear to be balanced, including with unconventional measures. First of all, across households, research finds that our unconventional measures have barely affected wealth inequality because they've had a positive impact on housing wealth. So asset price went up, but also households' wealth went up because of housing wealth. And this is fairly distributed, fairly evenly distributed across households and dominates wealth held in stocks and bonds. Furthermore, while some savers have seen their financial income reduced by lower interest rates, asset purchases have at the same time triggered a sizable reduction in unemployment and wage increases for the employed. In fact, households with the lowest incomes and the fewest liquid assets have benefited in particular from monetary easing. Estimates suggest that asset purchases by the central bank, which result in a 30 basis point decline in the term spread, reduce the unemployment rate among households in the bottom income quintile by two percentage points and contribute to a modest drop in the Gini coefficient on gross income. So the positive effect on employment, which, by the way, has risen by 9 million since, through, since the trough of the crisis, counterbalances any potential negative distributional effects of monetary policy. At the same, and the same appears to be true in other advanced economies, so not only in the euro area. But also we have to look at other distributional effects, the ones across member states, and these are similarly balanced. If we look at how the net interest income of different countries has been affected by falling interest since 2008, we don't see a picture of creditor countries losing out and debtor countries gaining. In fact, despite having a large international investment position, Germany has slightly gained from low rates, meaning it has received more in interest earnings than it has disbursed in interest payments. At the same time, all member states have benefited from the economic recovery and the stable macroeconomic environment, which was enabled by our expansionary policies. Since the launch of our measures, the dispersion of growth and unemployment rates across countries have fallen to their lowest since the start of the monetary union. So there is little to suggest that the use of unconventional measures during the crisis has created first order distributional effects, and certainly not to an extent that would undermine the rationale for central bank independence. And perhaps more importantly, the distributional effects of not acting to defend our mandate would have been very severe. This would have resulted in a fundamental shift in growth and inflation expectations, triggering a deflationary spiral with significant implications in particular for the poorer and the younger parts of the society. These various arguments against central bank independence also miss a more fundamental point, which is the value of an independent central bank that can act decisively without political pressure, and especially in the Euro area. Indeed, we saw clearly during the Euro area crisis that coordinated policy responses among governments were difficult to achieve, tended to arise only under severe market pressure, and then often turned out to be insufficient, requiring further responses later down the road. 
In this context, the governance structure of the euro system, where each member state is represented by the governor of its central bank in their own personal capacity, however, and he or she is not bound in their decision making by their nationality. So this governance was essential since it facilitated an effective systemic response. A central bank that was both independent and built to serve the whole of the euro area and not individual member states was able to create the required policy space in an extremely difficult context. And this brings me to my conclusion. Central banks are powerful, independent, and unelected. Now this combination can only square if they have a clearly defined mandate for which they are held accountable by the public. It is the legislators that define the mandate that establishes the goals of monetary policy making. And it is the legislators that are responsible for holding central banks accountable for the effectiveness of their monetary policy. But for effectiveness, credibility is essential. And therefore, legislators must want credible central banks. Credibility, however, hinges on independence. The central bank should not be subject to fiscal or political dominance and should be free to choose the instruments that are most appropriate to deliver their mandate. Legislators should therefore protect the independence of central banks as it is essential for fulfilling the mandate that they themselves have defined. The distributional consequences of monetary policy, if there are any, and other risks such as moral hazard and financial stability must be addressed by other tools, tools different from monetary policy. And these tools include fiscal policies, macroprudential policies, and banking supervision, policies that are more targeted and therefore inherently more appropriate for close scrutiny by the legislators. In this sense, their policies are very inherently different from monetary policy. Faced with future crises, central banks will adhere to their mandates and use their independence to fulfill them. In our case, the ruling of the European Court of Justice has shown that we can use all the tools within our mandate to tackle future challenges to price stability. We cannot foresee now what those challenges might be, but if and when they arise, they may require us to adjust our policy space once more to meet our mandate. The instruments we will deploy in such conditions and the safeguards, let's not forget them, the safeguards that accompany them will be commensurate with the nature of the challenges we confront. And at all times, it is crucial that we are transparent and accountable in our actions. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, dear president, on behalf of, uh, I think, everyone here, myself and the National Bank of Belgium, I should once again like to thank you for your willingness to deliver uh, this first key lecture in honor of Alexandre Lavalusi and concluding our scientific conference. I think, I think you have done him great honor in turn by, by producing such uh, rich and thorough thoughts about uh, the independence of central banks, uh, uh, a principle I think that was close also to his heart, uh, one on which he has also given, I think, uh, his own opinion about applying it in a complex, a complex environment, and, and one that he felt, uh, he too felt was uh, crucial to guarantee the efficiency of central banks' action, precisely the sort of action that the ECB and other central banks have taken since the crisis. So estimated participants, on behalf of the National Bank, I would now like to invite you to a reception that is being held uh, in the hall around the auditorium. Thank you for coming, and I hope to see you again on a future occasion. Thank you. <laughs>